Hello guys, welcome to Talking News. Please like and subscribe right now so you don't forget. That helps this channel out quite a bit, I think. Also, hit that notification bell if you would like notifications whenever I have new uploads. So right now, we're working into the month of October, which to me is the most interesting. So we're on part 8 of the Lori Vallow Then and Now. In part 7, we learned that the babysitter was kind of saying that Tylee wasn't didn't seem to be living in the same condo with Lori and JJ. We also learned that they learned that they moved to um, Rexburg. Though it's still unclear as the reason she moved there. But some rumors, like coming from the landlord from the home that her and Charles rented, that Charles was actually um, shot in, that he didn't want the family there any longer so october 1st of 2019 lori vallow has rented a storage unit lori's brother alex cox is served with an eviction notice for his santan valley rental house and we know that the rental well, the storage rental that Lori is getting, it's about a 10 by 10 storage unit, and it's from Storage Plus in Rexburg. At the time, the storage place did have surveillance cameras, but the footage that's been taken at the time, we wouldn't realize it until way later, and we'll talk about that later as well, that you really couldn't make out um, who the people were that were going to the storage unit with Lori at first. And there were approximately nine visits to the storage in the month of October and one time in November, according to the, you know, some of the information we have at this time. Of course, that can change as time goes along. Around this same time, which I find is very important, we're hearing that Chad Daybell increases the life insurance on his wife, Tammy Daybell. So these sources also say that Chad made significant increases to at least one policy before Tammy passed away. And when the story was first coming out, we didn't realize, you know, the exact time that Lori had signed that contract with the Self Storage Plus. But we're finding out that she did sign that contract on October 1st. Now, I do want to give y'all a little bit more details on this storage. So it says between, it's approximately on October 1st, um... 208 to um, 232 p.m. Lori signs a $53 per month rental agreement with this um, storage plus and Lori does visit this unit alone on October 1st and that's the only time that she's alone at that storage unit so at the time she's driving a blue Nissan Rogue Lori is seen removing a heavy tote from her car and placing it into the unit after she signs the contract. On October 2nd, this is where things really get interesting. At the time when the story came out, we didn't know anything about this, but we're going to go ahead and throw it in as if we did. Lori is on the internet and she's searching through Amazon. There, there is proof that she purchased a ring size 4 that is sterling silver it's not just any ring in fact it's it's a malachite gemstone some people say that this is a wedding ring and the reason why she chose a malachite ring and not a diamond is because it had these crazy properties and powers associated with it the mineral is often called the stone of transformation and what's really interesting in later documents, Melanie's new husband, Ian Pulaski, mentions the ring and what its properties are. I feel that's very significant to show, you know, how involved they are with Lori. So I want to give you a little background. According to a lot of the religion, um, gr well, religious group from even way back in the 3000 BC of ancient Egypt, Egyptians use Melakites as talesmen and because of their protective powers. We already heard of mention where it transforms, helps you transform, and it continues to say that this stone will help you deal with many changes that will happen in your life because it stimulates clear thinking and controlled emotions. 
One of the websites that promotes this type of gym says there will always be changes, surprises, and unexpected events. But knowing that you have protective and supportive energies of the Malachite can spell the difference between rising and falling. And I know a lot of people mention that she feels like she's invincible. Maybe this Malachite gem has something to do with that. And let me continue here. So it will help you heal on a physical and emotional level, removing anything that's making you feel weak or toxic. By removing all impure energies in your life, you're also stimulating the positive life force in your body and in your, er, I'm sorry, aura. I get so tongue twisted. For those of you that is new, you're new to this channel, I, you'll hear me stumble a lot. That's because I, I deal with dyslexia. But anyhow, this ring basically symbolizes the healing green of the nature around you. And guys, we've heard multiple times about, you know, people having visions um, affiliated with this case. So it says that what's more, it's known to have great visionary powers that can effectively ward off negative events from happening. It can keep you safe and protect you against accidents. Moreover, um, the, they say that this Malachite crystal helps you keep your senses sharp and your intuition sharper it adds in that it's also got a grounding quality that means that you um that when you do follow those hunches you do have rational backing to feel confident in your choices so i wanted to make sure i covered that so she's on amazon chad daybell is married to tammy daybell she's still alive and well charles vallo unfortunately is no longer here Lori's made this great move to Rexburg that she believes that's in her favor. And now she's shopping for a Malachite ring. So one thing's for certain is Lori's niece had talked to Lori about this Malachite and its healing properties. And Melanie is communicating with her new husband, Ian he's she's telling him all about these things also on october 2nd we have Lori. she shows up to her storage unit once again but she shows up with a man that media portrays to be alex cox but we later find out is actually chad daybell and this is very very interesting because when they're at the storage unit they're dropping off a tire in a rear car seat, what they believe is a rear car seat, around 2.30 p.m. that day. And as we move on in the story, you can see where it's a big difference of who is at that storage um, that day, whether it's Chad Daybell or Alex Cox. But we learn, like I said later, that it was Chad Daybell, which makes sense for what happens next. But for my um, viewers that like the details let me go ahead and share this it says that the surveillance video shows that daybell was driving into this business in Lori's blue nissan rogue but it took enhanced video um in order to figure out who it was actually driving a car so also significant on october 2nd and these sources kind of flop a little bit so i'm not certain how accurate this is they say that that ring that Lori ordered came in October 2nd as well so I mean we know with Amazon you can order something get it the same day or next day or even a few days later I'm still working on that one for you guys I also have other times of when uh, or timestamps on a video that showed the blue rogue arriving to the uh, storage unit around 1 25 p.m. But according to the owner of the storage facility, he says those clocks were off by one hour. So basically put them back at 2.25 p.m., which gives an official time of 2.29 is about the time that they pulled the tire out of the back of the Rogue and roll it into the storage unit. As well, they were removing what they believe was a tote bag at the time, but later were able to identify it was a car seat that they also put in there. I want to skip around a little bit and this is with reasons. So on October 3rd, 
they're seen going back to the storage and it's around 2 11 p.m i don't know how accurate that is right now i haven't been able to double check right now on everything so this man they say is likely alex cox he walks differently from the man before who was chad daybell he carries the tire out of the storage rolling it then returns back to the storage picks up the car seat by himself rather than uh, helping Lori like the day before and he puts it back into the vehicle so they were able to enhance this video and figure out that these items that were going in and out of the storage was a tire and a car seat and why is this important so it's very important because the Jeep Jeeps have spare tires on the back doors at the rear window most of them anyhow as long as that tire is attached to that rear window according to invest, uh, investigators they say that the back window will not open if that tire is still attached they explain you take the tire off then you can open up the back window they believe that this tire and this car seat that was put into the storage that day is possibly the um, parts of the jeep which once belonged to charles vallow who is no longer here now is to the jeep that tylee drives that alex is seen driving in october so once again a reminder this is on october 3rd that uh alex Cox is, is seen putting the tire and the car seat back into a vehicle so we're going back to october 2nd so Brandon Boudreaux, which is Lori's niece's husband. It's October 2nd. He's in his Gilbert, Arizona home. Or at, sorry guys. And a bullet narrowly misses Brandon and shatters the driver's side window of his Tesla. Now this is a key word. Paintball gun, guys. So at first, Brandon thought that the shooter was using a paintball gun due to the sound that it made, but... When he examines his car, he sees that bullet hole and realizes that this is a real gun, most likely with a silencer. Some sources say, though, that he didn't see anything. And then some sources say that he did recognize this vehicle the shooter was in. And the vehicle was matching the description of Tylee's Jeep, which was formerly Charles Vallow's Jeep. Some say, I've um, not been able to really update this, guys. It's really hard to keep up. I'm trying to get this finished. But um, some sources say that Brandon's the one that called 911, and some sources say it's Brandon's father. Regardless, Brandon was um, headed to the gym or coming back from the gym. The dispatcher from 911 asked him, did you see the guy that was actually, and Brandon says, quote, I didn't see who it was, end quote. Most of this, um, the call to the 911 was redacted, but uh, it's unclear, you know, whether he knew who it was or not, because sometimes in interviews, Brandon suspects that it was Alex Cox driving. Brandon said that he knew Charles Vallow well and knew all about um, the shooting with Alex Cox with Charles Vallow, and that was back in July. Now, some people like Melanie were saying that uh, Brandon was making this up, but they actually caught on CCTV and it was later confirmed to be registered to the late Charles Vallow. So most likely it was Alex Cox driving that Jeep. Needless to say that this was so devastating to Brandon that he and his four children went into hiding. So there's a few more um, details I want to add. They say that the Jeep was parked just outside of Brandon's house waiting for him, which fired a single rifle shot. Some sources say that Alex didn't take off immediately or whoever they believe it to be that was in that Jeep. Um, but in some sources, they said that he fired the shot and then took off fleeing the scene. Now, I'm not sure if I got this correct, but at some point in this time, Brandon claimed that, you know, Melanie had knowledge of where Tylee and JJ were. I, I'm not certain where that fits on or if it's even true. But one thing's for certain that on October 3rd, 
Lori Vallow is on her computer. Now she already ordered a, a wedding ring and now she's searching for a wedding dress. And we'll actually go into more details in the future about this. Just a day later, it's October 4th of 2019 and Tammy Daybell is visiting her parents in Springville, Utah. And it's about 15 days before, you know, she would come into contact with what they suspect Alex Cox. In the interview that talks about where Tammy was um, on October 4th, it's also said that she was healthy and doing Zumba and clogging class. And this is according to her father. Also on October 4th, a judgment is entered in Santan Valley. Um, it's an eviction case against Alex. Now, I'm not positive on this, but I do have it noted. So I'll share it just in case. Just know that this is a, you know, iffy note that I'm putting in here. So sometime between October 6th to, uh, to October 26th, a man people believe to be Alex Cox visits Lori's Rexburg storage unit alone five times. He drops off a variety of item and items, including gun cases. So if this is an absolute fact, that's quite interesting. You can find that on East Idaho News. And then here we have October 6th of 2019. It's 1.42 to 1.50 p.m. I'm not certain if this clock is behind or not, but a man visits Lori's storage unit alone and and a pickup truck belonging to Alex, he takes something out of the unit, and that's according to Dateline. October 7th um, of 2019, they realized that Lori is still using Charles Vallow's Amazon account and other, th you know, things. I'm not certain what they are right now. Now, October 7th, a screenshot shows up online. It verified by three people close to the investigation, showing that the ring was delivered uh, October 7th so this is uh, it was delivered to her townhome where Lori is staying on Pioneer Road in Rexburg. The name on this item is Charles Vallow which is Lori um, deceased husband. So that's an important date. She gets this ring delivered to her that is the same ring that's on her finger you will hear about shortly. It's October 9th of 2019 and Approximately eight days later um, from the Brandon incident, or seven days, something like that, there's a shoot, shooting attempt on Tammy, she says. Well, according to some resources, Tammy Daybell called 911 and said a masked man shot at her with a paintball gun. She also wrote about her experience on her Facebook post saying that she has no idea what the motive was. In my opinion, it's, uh, we remember hearing where Charles was going to contact Tammy Daybell and tell her about, you know, the affair between Chad and Lori. Obviously, that didn't happen, it seems. She said this man uh, was uh, wearing a ski mask, appears in her driveway, on, which was in Salem. And as Tammy was unloading groceries from her car, he points what she believes to be a paintball gun at her. So this is very interesting to me because Tammy describes that he pulls the trigger several times, but the weapon doesn't appear to be loaded. Tammy says she tries several times to ask a man, what, what are you doing? But he never spoke. Tammy says she yelled for Chad and the man ran away. So she did report this, like I mentioned earlier, to the Fremont County Sheriff's Office. But when she spoke to them, the Sheriff's Office believed it was most likely a prank and never found the man. You can look this up at the Rexburg Standard Journal. Interesting, I would like to know what Chad was doing during all this. How did he handle it? We haven't heard that. Let me read her Facebook post. So she says, quote, something really weird just happened and I want you to know so that you can watch out. I had gotten home and parked in our front in the front of our driveway. As I was getting stuff out of the back seat, a guy wearing a ski mask was suddenly standing by the back of my car with a paintball gun. He shot at me several times, although I don't think it was loaded. I yelled for Chad. 
and he ran off around the back of my house. How creepy is that, guys? But it's hard for me to think that. I mean, I don't think he would have had an unloaded gun. My speculation is, I wonder if there was something in that gun other than bullets. Is it maybe a poisonous gash? He could have shot out at her. And I say this because of what's going to happen next. But again, guys, it's just speculation. We're, we have to wait. I know that I was trying to um, do some research on some poisons that maybe he could have shot out that game uh, gun like um, arsenic and other things. But I never had a chance to finish that research. So I want to remind you, it's October 10th, and no one has seen Tinley since Yellowstone in September. But she's showing some sort of activity. She's sending Colby money through Vimo on Facebook. In that um, Vimo message, they write, we love you. Now I have another note that I would like to, to share with you that I've put in addition but I really wasn't certain where to put it, like a few things that I've shared, but I'm gonna go ahead and share it here. So one of the things that's worth noting is the fact that Alex admitted that he tried to kill Ryan when he was in court. And that's when he attacked Lori's husband with the taser gun that we spoke about on uh, previous videos. So I feel like that's very, very important for this case that we know that he did admit to that. Maybe that's one of the reasons he's no longer here is the fact that he's already showed evidence that he will talk when he's put in a situation where he has no choice. Okay, guys, so we're moving on to October 13th of 2019. And Brandon Boudreau, which is the husband of Melanie, Lori's niece, meets with a guy named Rich Robertson, which is an Arizona-based private investigator with a WR3 investigations. The investigator says, quote, he was so anxious that we actually meet my office on a Sunday morning and he told me this wild tale of killing and missing people and religious cults and that he had been a victim of a drive-by shooting. Basically, the bottom line for him is at the point where he was hoping I could find Alex Cox in the Jeep that Alex was driving and he hoped that I could find his wife, whom he had lost contact with for about a few weeks. They were going through a divorce and they were supposed to exchange their four kids and she didn't show up for the last meeting. And then he was a target of a drive-by shooting and he thought he, that he recognized his assailant as being Alex Cox, end quote. So October 15, 2019, a right of restitution is requested. Um, and this is to evict Alex from the Santan Valley rental house. So that's according to court documents. So that's probably a pretty reliable date. So around October 16th of 2019, approximately 11.05 to 11.11 a.m., they believe Alex visits Lori storage unit he's there by himself in a pickup that's according to dateline october 16th as well at around 1 43 p.m uh, tylee's uh sending something through vimo again so october 19th 2019 approximately 10 21 p.m tylee's um friend sends tylee a text to say that she misses her and that she's been thinking about her but she didn't get a reply until six days later and that's according to the post register but the most significant thing that happened on October 19th of 2019 was Tammy Daybed Bell, sorry guys, went to bed the night before with the symptoms of coughing. She was at uh, she was only 49, and according to the Rexburg Police Department, they got a call saying that um, Tammy Daybell had passed away in her bed through the night. This was devastating to Tammy's family because a lot of people and her friends said that she seemed very healthy and her father, Ron Douglas, saw her two weeks earlier saying that she was in good condition.
Tammy's father said that he was grief stricken when Chad called him after Tammy died, saying that she had gone to bed the night before with a terrible cough, but just never woke up. So the key thing is, is on October 18th, Tammy goes to bed. She has a coughing fit. She says she doesn't feel well, but her family says she's never really been an unhealthy person. So I would like to share the address where this happened. So she was found deceased by her family members at her home at 202 North 1900 East Rexburg, Salem, um, Idaho. When the officers, the Fremont County officers, go to the Salem home in response to a call about her death, now they have this coroner that arrives. Her name is Brenda Dye. Now remember guys, we've seen things on her where they said that she doesn't even have a high school diploma is what I'm hearing. Haven't been able to finish that research either. But she shows up to their home and examines the body. When they take Tammy from that residence, they decide to say that there will be no autopsy performed. Brenda Dye writes on a death certificate, death certificate that the death is related to natural causes and decided that Tammy didn't need this autopsy. So an investigator said when he went out there and he quotes, my deputies responded and as we do with most unattended, unattended deaths, they took pictures. They looked it over and contacted our detectives. Humphreys continues and says that the detectives had a few questions. They satisfied those got the information they needed and didn't see anything that alarmed them, end quote. He said that he asked if Chad Daybell was acting suspiciously and Humphrey said the responded def deputy said they didn't notice anything odd. Quote, to my knowledge, he was responding like anybody would whose spouse had just passed away. That's why the deputies did not suspect anything suspicious, end quote. But for some reason, what's odd to me is they didn't notice that 10 days prior to this that Tammy had called the police to report that a masked man had fired an empty paintball gun at her when she pulled into her driveway. So something is very odd. It just sounds like they weren't doing a very good job. That's my opinion, guys. Humphrey continues, says, quote, there wasn't anything there at the time that we could do, and everybody kind of summed it up as a prank, end quote. So they just couldn't put the two together, I guess. They just, they thought it was a prank, so therefore, nothing was suspicious. So ultimately, Chad Daybell's lifelong wife, 49-year-old Tammy Daybell, died mysteriously in Salem, and she was buried in Springville, Utah. In her obituary, it claimed that she died of natural causes. And she was buried, I think it was October 22nd of 2019. There was a memorial service in Rexburg the following day, but the family, a lot of friends of the Daybells and stuff had some concerns about how they had service for Tammy. As well in this uh, time period, Humphrey says that he's notified or alerted by detectives in Arizona about other deaths. This was exceptionally hard for Tammy's parents to accept because they said just early October, Tammy Daybell was dancing in their parents and her parents' living room. They explained that Tammy, who was a librarian, seemed in good spirits and good health. It just didn't seem right to them. I'll go into more details on her orbit as well as um, what friends seen because uh, some friends were concerned that this was kind of put together really fast and that when they attended the funeral that there wasn't even a casket present. And there's a problem because right after Tammy passes away, Chad Daybell collects 430000 from Tammy's life insurance policy. And so this is according to the affidavit of probable cause. On October 21st through the 24th of 2019, um, the Idaho school where Tammy was a librarian holds a book donation. Oops, sorry guys, lost my spot. A book do donation drive in her memory and makes a remembrance corner in the library to help the children remember her. 
So this is at Central Elementary Book Fair. Like promised, October 22nd, funeral services are held in Utah, and Tammy Daybell is buried again you already know this at springfield utah so on october 24th of 2019 chad moves out of his salem idaho house which he shared with tammy um, and his two adult children he told his kids that he wanted to sell his house and the book publishing business um, that he and tammy had built um, back in 2004 but according to some sources the children talked him out of that one on October 25th of 2019, approximately 11.14 a.m., Tylee's um, friend receives a reply to her October 19th text saying, Hi, miss you guys too. Love ya. The friend says that that really didn't sound anything like Tylee. The friend said, quote, She spelled out her words for the most part. Plus, she would have texted more if I reached out, end quote. And that's on the post register. So on October 25th of 2019, around 1248 to 1247 p.m., a man visits Lori's storage unit alone in a pickup truck, which is, belongs to Alex Cox. They're able to make out that he takes something out of that unit. Um, but at that time, I think when this first happened, I think they might have figured out it could have been Chad Daybell I don't know I need to update this a little bit October 26 of 2019 the run for refugee uh, 5k that Tammy Daybell had planned to be part of well she isn't on October 26 approximately 507 to 517 p.m. a man visits Lori storage unit alone in a pickup truck belonging to the Alex and he put something into the unit. And this is according to Dateline. October 28, 2019, approximately 2 o'clock to 2.06 p.m., two men are seen driving Alex's pickup truck, and they're seen on a CCTV at Lori Rexburg's uh, storage unit. They're seen moving bikes into the unit. They also take items out of that unit. They identify these two later as Chad and Alex. And so this is really literally just a few days after Tammy's funeral, guys. So October 29th of 2019, a neighbor's ring doorbell captures footage of Lori still living in the, on uh, Pioneer Road. They also captured an unidentified woman coming to visit her. So late in October 2019, Tylee's brother, uh, Colby Ryan, notices that Tylee's texts to him have become less frequent and they have changed. Just like Tylee's friend, he says that the text didn't sound like Tylee and were not written the way that she normally would reply. So October 31st of 2019, it's Halloween, and the nanny that was hired through uh, somethingcare.com, I'm sorry guys, I didn't get it all, um, in September again texts Lori to ask if her services are needed for JJ. There was no response. This is according to AZ Family. So October 31st to around November 1st of 2019, the private investigator hired by Brandon Boudreau observes Alex and Melanie um, load up a U-Haul outside of Melanie's Chandler, Chandler home and discard the children's items out on the curb. Now these dates I'm not positive about, but I'm assuming that these are probably the most likely dates that this happened. Their private investigator said, quote, it's all kid stuff. It was clothing. It was like blankets. It was toys, mattresses, bedding materials. And they were out on the curb. Sorry, guys, lost my spot a little bit with a little cardboard sign that said free. The investigator says that he tracked Melanie to Rexburg, not Boise. Quote, we saw them loading a the U-Haul. They rented in Arizona and took it to Rexburg. And we saw where they were living, but uh, didn't see the kids, in quote. Alrighty, guys. Well, I about hit my limit here. And we will continue this on part nine. So I'm wishing you guys um, to be safe out there. Stay healthy. Love you guys. And I'll see you guys soon.